The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. In the book of Job, we see a conversation between God and Satan, a conversation that then takes place over 42 chapters. There are a tremendous number of lessons that we can learn from the book of Job. We learn about the character of God. We learn of the power and constraints of Satan. There are a tremendous number of lessons that we can learn from these 42 chapters. However, today I am going to focus on a lesson in the book of Job that people tend to overlook. Before I shine light on this one lesson in the book of Job, people tend to overlook. We need to walk through the first 41 chapters of this astonishing book in order to give some context surrounding the 42nd chapter. Because the lesson we are going to learn is in this very last chapter of the book. The first verse of the book of Job tells us that Job is a man who was perfect and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. This is a powerful statement that speaks volumes about the character of Job and his relationship with God. First and foremost, we see that Job was a man who feared God. This does not mean that he was afraid of God, but rather that he had a deep reverence and respect for God. He recognized that God was the creator and sustainer of all things, and that his life was dependent on God's grace and mercy. This attitude of humility and gratitude is essential for anyone who seeks to walk in faith and obedience to God. Secondly, we see that Job was a man who turned away from evil. He did not give in to temptation or allow himself to be led astray by the desires of the flesh. Thirdly, we see that Job was a man who was perfect and upright. This does not mean that he was sinless, but rather that he was a man of great moral character and integrity. He was a man who was committed to doing what was right, even when it was hard. And he was a man who lived his life with honesty sincerity and transparency. Satan appeared before God and challenged him, saying that Job only worshipped him because he had been blessed with prosperity and good fortune. God allowed Satan to test Job's faith by taking away his possessions and killing his children. In the course of one day, Job receives four messages, each bearing separate news that his livestock, servants, and ten children have all died due to marauding invaders or natural catastrophes. Job tears his clothes and shaves his head in mourning, but he still blesses God in his prayers. Despite this tragedy, Job remained faithful to God and did not curse him or question his will. Satan then asked for permission to afflict Job personally, to which God agreed, with the stipulation that he could not take his life. Satan afflicted Job with painful sores from head to toe. Job's wife urged him to curse God and die, but he refused. Within the book of Job, we meet three of Job's friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, who came to comfort him and try to help him make sense of his suffering. Job lamented his condition, expressing his pain and confusion, and wondering why God has allowed him to suffer so greatly. Job's three friends accused him of committing sins and being responsible for his own suffering. They believed that Job's misfortunes were a direct result of his wrongdoing, and that he must have done something to deserve such punishment from God. They tried to convince Job to confess his sins and repent in order to receive God's mercy and forgiveness. Job vehemently denied this and continued to maintain his innocence. Then, within the book of Job, we are introduced to a young man named Elihu, who speaks up, chastising Job for his complaints and suggesting that God's ways are beyond human understanding. Now we are going to look at the lesson that a lot of people overlook in the book of Job. And that is what Job was doing when God delivered him from all his problems. Job 42, 7 through to 10. And it was so, that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz and Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, and that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So Eliphaz, and Temanite, and Bildad, and Shohite, and Zophar the Naamathite, went, and did according as the Lord commanded them. The Lord also accepted Job, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job, 
when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Here, we see that God was angry about the three friends of Job because they had not told the truth about him. God directed his rebuke towards Job's three companions, with Eliphaz being the first to speak. God acknowledged that Job was his servant and had spoken of him in a way that was correct, unlike his companions, who spoke in general principles that did not apply to Job's unique situation. Despite having wise principles, their portrayal of God as being angry and judgmental towards Job was inaccurate and displeasing to God, and they had to be reconciled to Job so he could pray for them. All of this happened not just for the three friends' sake, but for Job's. When he had prayed for them, everything changed for him. So we notice that the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he was doing two things. One, when he was forgiving his friends. Two, when he prayed for others. This is so interesting and so thought-provoking because in this last chapter of the book of Job, it appears as if the condition for Job's friends to be restored to God was Job's forgiving intercession for them. And in the same breath, it also appears that the condition for God restoring Job's fortunes was the same. The first time I read this, I sat down and wondered for a while if there was a deeper meaning to the conclusion of the book of Job. Because it is extraordinary that God would not simply accept the repentant prayers of those three friends for themselves individually. However, they had to seek out Job to pray for them. The man they had accused of sinning against God, the man they had accused of wrongdoing, was the one who God would listen to his prayers, and not the prayers of these three men. What can we learn from this? Firstly, we need to forgive others. Imagine Job's predicament. Job had ten children, seven sons, and three daughters and all of them died in a tragic event. They were having a feast at the oldest brother's house when a strong wind suddenly struck the house and caused it to collapse, killing all of them. All of his wealth destroyed, his health also gone, and now he had three friends attempting to get him to confess for a sin he did not commit. Imagine the emotions that Job felt when his friends were pointing the finger at him. The majority of people would not take those accusations well. Being falsely accused for something you did not do, for sins you have not committed, during the worst period of your life, where you have lost your wealth, health, and children. Yet Job forgave these three men. Job became the umpire between God and his three friends. By forgiving his friends and praying for them, Job brought back blessing into his own life. The truth is, we only hurt ourselves when we refuse to forgive. The Lord's Prayer says, Matthew 6, 12, and forgive us our sins, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Now, let's bring this lesson home back to you in your life. Who do you need to forgive? Who is that person in your life that did you wrong? Who is that person that wronged you? Who is that person that double-crossed you? Who is that person who was supposed to love you and didn't? Who is that person who was supposed to be faithful to you and then wasn't? And in your heart right now, you are angry at them. Who is that person? The word from God today is that you need to forgive them today. Forgiveness. It does not mean you leave yourself exposed for them to destroy you once again. No. Forgiveness is letting go of that grudge you are holding on to in your soul. Who is that person you are holding on to? Is it your ex-wife? An ex-wife that destroyed your very life? You need to forgive her. Is it your ex-husband who mistreated you and never honored your marriage? you need to forgive that man. Or maybe it was your current husband or wife that has wronged you. Forgive them today. Is the person you need to forgive your mother or father who absolutely failed at being the good parent you needed? God's message for you today is you have to forgive. This is not a popular message, but to God, forgiveness matters. Forgiveness helps you more than it helps the person you are forgiving. We may feel justified in holding on to our anger, bitterness, and resentment towards those who have wronged us. We may feel that we are entitled to our feelings, that we are justified in our anger, and that forgiveness is not possible. However, holding on to your anger and bitterness only harms us. It causes us to become prisoners of our own negative emotions, and it prevents us from experiencing the freedom that comes with forgiveness. Unforgiveness keeps us trapped in the past, unable to move forward, and it prevents us from experiencing the fullness of life that God has in store for us. Because if you don't forgive, you will become a bitter person, and bitterness is one of the worst things that can happen to a person. And I am a pastor. Pastors see these things. I've seen bitter people in my life. 
people who were so bitter to the point that all that was inside them was dead. They are living, yet dead, because bitterness has eaten up all the joy inside them, all the life inside them. I have seen bitterness destroy lives to the point where the person becomes numb and there is no life left inside of them. They are just numb to the point where they don't even feel any pain anymore, where the person is just existing. They are no longer living. They are just existing. That is what bitterness can do. The truth is, we only hurt ourselves when we refuse to forgive. You must forgive. And forgiving them does not condone what they did to you. It does not excuse the evil and wickedness they have committed against you. Your job is to forgive and not to harbor resentment or attempt to settle the score. It is God's job to settle the score, not yours. Forgiveness is not about excusing the wrong that has been done to us. It is not about forgetting the hurt or pretending that it never happened. Rather, forgiveness is about releasing ourselves from the pain of the past, about letting go of our hurt, and about choosing to move forward in love and mercy. We cannot experience the love, joy, and peace that God has in store for us if we are holding on to our anger and bitterness. Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgiveness is not an option, it is a commandment. We cannot expect God to forgive us if we are unwilling to forgive others. Therefore, let us choose to forgive. Let us release ourselves from the pain of the past and embrace the freedom and joy that comes with forgiveness. The second thing Job did was pray for his friends. The Lord turned the captivity of Job when he forgave his friends and prayed for them. And the truth is, you and I will find the same things in our lives that there will be times when we are interceding for others with a pure heart and with good intentions and faith for others. And God answers a need in our own life. Who is the person you need to pray for today? Who is the person you need to forgive today? Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish.